for coming out today. Uh, Dr. Hill thought we would be okay with the 20 chairs that were in here earlier. But he didn't listen. Uh, we're getting some more chairs. We're going to set them up over there, so I promise you won't have to sit on the floor. Uh, thanks for coming out today. And uh, this is sort of a special Community of Learners event. Normally we have these Friday morning at 10 a.m. in the Ralph Curie Forum, but we're sort of booked this semester. And uh, we wanted to get, uh, have an opportunity for Matt to come in and speak to you all about his uh, most recent, well, most recent, <laughs> as you know, uh, 20, his only, uh, his <laughs> project. <laughs> not only, he's getting ready to write another book. Uh, uh, but this is a pretty exciting, uh, at a university like ours, where we, uh, we thrive on good teaching, and uh, we're excited about the opportunity to do good scholarship as well. And uh, Matt's work here is an, an example of the sort of excellence in scholarship we, we get excited about with our faculty. His book is titled Evolution and Holiness, Sociobiology, Altruism, and the Quest for Western Perfection. And I, I can tell you as a colleague and friend of his that um, he has uh, wrestled a lot with how uh, to present this work and, um, and uh, whether even at one point he, he should publish it. And I, I think that this is uh, the, the fruit of labor and hard work of, of doing what, what he thought uh, needed to be done, and IVP thought so too. And so uh, please give him your attention. We'll have time at the end for more questions you have. So please welcome him. Like the, like the soccer coach on the road? 
Well, why not, right? You go to the you go to a baseball coach or a baseball player and you say, like, how does this whole pitching thing work? Or what's the point of this? And why do they pitch like this? And they're like, you idiot, that's cricket, you know, something like that. Right? Uh, uh, I think cricket's actually like this. <laughs> Very good. That's how this is gonna go. Um, so, uh, if scientists are saying from various perspectives, lots of perspectives, astronomy, um, chemistry, biochemistry, uh, geology, um, anthropology, um, that, uh, that this is kind of the way that uh, humans have, have, you know, have came about, then what does that mean for our Christian faith? So that's really my task. If scientists come out tomorrow and say, um, you know, the world was made 30 seconds ago, it's just really weird, feels like it's really old, and be like, okay, well, what do we do with that, you know, theologically? So that's kind of the thing. So it's been a big fight for a while. So I'm not going to talk too much about the fight between evolution or evolution <laughs> and but anytime you can get a picture of Jesus punching Darwin in the face, I feel like that should go with a topic like this. Um, this one I found was Darwin's got a wrench. You can see that. He's about to give Jesus a one four, but he's got brass knuckles. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that we have to see these things at odds. Um, you know, we can see them in like, the world in like, kind of light uh, than this. But there is a major, so just to put this out of the, the mind, you know, right now, again, I'm not going to focus on this the whole time, but I just want to address this very quickly. I do think there is a major conflict between evolution and uh, uh, some aspects of theology, but that's mostly between neo, what, what most people call, certainly Connor Cunningham, uh, calls this between neo-Darwinists and creationists, so people who are kind of militantly uh, atheistic and somehow try to use evolutionary theory to, to, to show how God's not real or something like that, and creationists who, um, you know, ironically, it's like people always talking past each other, right? So the militant neo-Darwinists are certainly not theists, and many uh, you know, uh, six-day creationists are not scientists, uh, at least with terminal degrees. Uh, so there, there's going to be a natural conflict with people talking past each other. I think there's also a major conflict between literalists and non-literalists, so people who kind of read um, the Bible. Again, that's not what this is about, that's not what I want to talk about, but let's not pretend that those conflicts aren't there, I just think that those conflicts are between uh, Orthodox Christianity and um, uh, non-kind of um, argumentative uh, evolutionary <coughs> Alright, so then let's move on from there. So, idea number letter A. Idea letter A. Um, human roots. There's a picture of Buddy Jesus. Everybody, if you're familiar with the movie, Buddy Jesus holding up Origin of the Species. <laughs> I just realized this is pretty small. It might not make you laugh, but really. Um, also, real quick caveat before I kind of go on. If you don't believe in evolution here, uh, that's fine. You don't, you don't need to, you know, if you don't want to. And, you know, you can be. There's lots of ways to be Christian, um, and you know that's fine. So not trying to like push some sort of agenda or anything like that. But also, but if you do, um, you know, I think you're in good company with a lot of people. Certainly a lot of faculty um, and a lot of staff. All right. Okay. So we have some human roots, um, and these human roots are complicated, at least according to what scientists tell us. That. Uh, these root, and this is what called sociobiology is is applied uh, evolutionary theory. So what does that mean for behavior? So so if if if, uh, if we have evolved, if if any species have evolved, then through the process of evolution, then that is going to impact what it means to be active, what what your actions actually function like. And certainly for human evolution, sociobiology biology towards human evolution would be. How does that impact, uh, certainly a particular concern is how does that impact moral behavior? So what does that mean um, morally? So are, are our evolutionary roots um, based, uh, does, that, does that impact whether we're a good person or a bad person? And if that's the case, then are we actually culpable or responsible for our moral behavior? Um, maybe, maybe not. So if that's the case, if we have, if we are a genetic, um, genetically the result of uh, let me step back one second. Evolution, in case for any of you who kind of aren't aware of how it works, is it, and this is super simple, and forgive me, any scientists that are in the room uh, that, that want to say otherwise or, or chime in, that's fine too. 
Um, evolution involves two basic things, mutation and replication, and that's kind of it. So that's evolution. So things mutate, and if it's helpful, then they wrap a head. It makes it easier to replicate. Um, so sexual reproduction is a, is a really easy example of that. Um, it's, it's, it's way better for species to sexually reprodu reproduce um, on some level because it kind of mixes up the genetics, um, which helps you to kind of stay advanced of um, the, the bio-warfare that's going on in your body that's trying to kill you kind of every day. So the fact that you are a mix between your genetic mom and your genetic dad is really good, actually. So it's sort of like if you have a model with a crop and pests or you know light figures out what that is, it's gone in a generation. Well, that's not the case when you introduce things like sexual reproduction. So that was a that was a benefit, you know. But there's all sorts of traits from social biology. We would say there's all sorts of traits that that are either positive or, or negative benefits as well. So what does that mean? Well, one of the reasons why I think this is important to talk about really quickly is because we, this says we live in a world with mismatched instincts. So uh, we have a lot of instincts that are from a long time ago. Uh, and our instincts are mismatched with, uh, with where we are today. So they were beneficial, uh, but now they might not be so beneficial. So it was really beneficial to be able to want to reproduce all the time. Because people who didn't reproduce, guess how many children they had? The people who didn't want to reproduce, guess how many children they had? Uh, zero, right? <laughs> so you are all descendants of your parents and your grandparents getting frisky one night. Isn't that a beautiful thought, right? Um, so uh, think about that and be happy. Because if they didn't have that inclination, this is horrible. If they didn't have that inclination, then you wouldn't be here. So there are some things that are really beneficial, right? But we also live in a time where we have what's called supernormal allurements. So think about french fries or pornography. These are perfect examples of supernormal allurements. French fries aren't food. Right? They're food-like. They're salt and they're fat, and your body says, holy cow, what have I just gotten into? These are magnificent. And you just eat and eat and eat, right? Well, your ability to maintain fat was really good. That was, but that is a mismatched instinct with the ubiquity of food and um, substance that we have now, right? So that we have these, this problem, we have a combination of French fries and um, mismatched instincts. Pornography and mismatched instincts. So I think personally, where I come, where I come from personally, is if, if we say, oh, forget evolution, we don't need to worry about it, or something like that. Well, we're not telling our kids, like, watch out for French fries. Watch out for pornography. Like, you're going to want to just look at that. You're going to want to eat as much as you can, but you can't. <laughs> that was beneficial, that's where that's coming from, but it's not beneficial anymore. So there are reasons, I think, to be open and honest with some of this stuff, I think. Alright, well what happens is, you get a group of people that, that came about, uh, Richard Dawkins is a guy that I'll talk about in a second as one of them, um, they come, come about and, and do what I call the Benjamin Button Effect. Alright, so you know, uh, you know Benjamin Button, you've seen the movie, right? Curious, George Case. <laughs> right? um, he works backwards. He's always reduced. He's reducing down to like a uh, a young baby, right? He's an old man, I think. I don't, I don't truly remember the movie. I'm like, oh, this is good, kids. Um, <laughs> I'll get it on that. All right. So what we get is um, there's a guy who came on the scene named Richard Dawkins, um, who came up with this concept called the selfish gene back in the '70s, and um, on, on some level, he's he's really right, and on other levels, uh, he's really really wrong, um, and that's that's part of where the, at least the first couple chapters in this my project kind of critique. Uh, he's got this really interesting uh, statement that I'd like to read for you. If you can't see this. It says, "We are survival machines." I mean, listen to the language, but I mean, do you do a close reading of this, right? We are survival machines. Robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. This is a truth which still fills me with astonishment, according to Richard Dawkins. So you've heard of like survival of the fittest, right? You guys have heard of survival of the fittest and the fit survive, whatever, something like that. Well, what, what Dawkins tries to say, and this is kind of his new piece that he brought to um, social biology, is that it's not about survival of the fittest, it's survival of the fittest for the sake of the genes. So um, it does no good if you're like if you are massively intelligent and massively strong and you can live to be 150 but you can't reproduce. 
according to these theories, obviously we, we as, as Christians, as kind of thinking humans would say like, well that's, your, your worth is not dependent on your reproductive fitness, that's a silly concept. But not according to Dawkins, it's not a silly concept. Um, your worth really is dependent on how well you are in reproduct you're reproductively fit. And so you are a, uh, a vehicle by which your genes can reproduce. And this is where we get this idea of the selfish gene. So all of your, all throughout all of sociobiological or evolutionary history, you, um, uh, what all that has mattered has been to uh, be able to get your genes to the next generation. And those that were good at that survived, that's good, good for that survived, those that weren't didn't. So here's what happens. Altruism, or altruism in other words for that is compassion or kindness or generos generosity is a virtue I guess, but um, it's being selfless, I guess would be maybe synonymous to altruism. Altruism is a problem that altruism is a problem for the selfish gene. Why would that be? Why do you think is that, can anybody get a show? I don't know if you're supposed to do this in a lecture. <laughs> Whatever. So anybody uh, can say, why do you think altruism is a problem? Anybody have an idea? Like, I don't want to go. Yeah. It's a sacrifice. Yeah, so like going, you jump on a grenade or something like that. Well, a lot of good that did to you, right? <laughs> um, or if you sacrifice for the community, um, you give up some of your food so other people can have food. But maybe that, that aren't even your, your kin. Um, or you're going to get some sort of reciprocal relationship for later. So if I sacrifice for you, but I know that you're going to scratch my back later, then, then that might make sense. That's a calculated move. But, but we know that altruism, genuine altruism, does exist. Where you sacrifice with no benefit to your kin, or no benefit to a reciprocal relationship later on. So that's a problem. Because we can actually measure that, and we can see that that's actually happening. So um, some people have speculated, um, oh, well, that's, you know, uh, maybe, you know, God in us, or that's um, something unique to humans only. What we're trying to, what, what, and I, I shouldn't use the word we, but what scientists have kind of started to figure out uh, recently in the last maybe 50 years or so is that this is not something that actually, altruism is not a phenomenon necessarily unique uh, to humans. So this is both, I think this is both good and bad from a Christian perspective. Because it sort of takes away our little, like, well, God, the, the mystery card of, like, well, God kind of fills that gap there. And maybe this is actually, altruism is kind of a natural phenomenon as well. So Richard Dawkins starts off as a problem. We'll come back to him um, in a little bit. Uh, then you have this, this other, another kind of interesting factor that comes in with social biology called the, uh, what I um, end up calling the reduction of the, the whole person. Do we have free will? If you can't see this little thing, this would be great. It's a guy holding a hammer. And he's looking at it, and he's got three options. The one option is break a piggy bank with it, the other option is hammer and nail with it. The other option is just about to hit somebody in the head, which is terrible. <laughs> Do we have free will? Um, a lot of people in this field uh, think that we probably do not have free will. Um, here's a famous this is the guy who kind of came up or discovered DNA, um, uh, at least on some levels. Francis Craig says this, your joy, think about this, listen to this phenomenal quote, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, and your ambitions, your sense of identity and free will are in fact no more than, than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You're nothing but a pack of neurons. You're nothing but a pack of neurons. Right? Because if, if you are genetically programmed, in a way, through you know, uh, eons of evolution to fine tune this machine that is really good at replicating itself. The, the, these genes have found this kind of host, and this is the language that's being used actually. These genes have found this kind of host person that's really good at replicating itself. Then really you're nothing but a pack of neurons. You think you're free, but actually freedom, freedom is a, is a convenient tool that evolution um, kind of uses to, to help you kind of see like there's a point to living and stuff like that. So I'll just kind of keep on and keep it on. So um, I, I think we would question that on some level. So not all sociobiologists are there, um, but I think uh, this kind of uh, strict determinist perspective is something that we should balk at um, a little bit. At least. Yeah, I'll tell you why in a second. So, all right, so remember Dawkins. Let's look back at Dawkins. Here's another one. An altruistic system is inherently unstable because it is open to abuse by selfish individuals 
ready to exploit it. These are powerful statements from the 70s. All right. So this is the this is the problem. This is the problem with some of these statements. These kind of uh, uh, dogmatic statements in a way. This is from the 70s. Okay. So let's look at it um, a little bit more. Um, the science is out there. Um, Richard Dawkins. So this, what I'm going to now show you is, um, this comes from Franz the Ball. First I'm going to show you something about fairness, and then I'm going to show you uh, something that is altruism within animals. So this is first one is uh, kind of a study on fairness that Franz the Ball does. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does, and she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. Against the wall, she needs to give it to us, and she gets cucumber again. <laughs> this monkey doesn't like it, right? Why did this this monkey doesn't like it? This monkey is realizing, like, hey, grapes are better. I mean, I think definitely we would also agree that grapes are better than cucumbers, right? Cucumbers are just water. Uh, grapes just taste great. Um, so this this monkey is not dumb. It's looking at this the, his buddy next door, and his buddy's getting a grape, and he's like, "What the heck? We the same thing, right?" Um, so animals have this kind of sense of fairness, um, but fairness is not altruism, is it? Fairness is just like uh, like I want mine. You're getting yours. I want mine. Well, Duval does a bunch of other studies that actually lead towards. Uh, kind of show a pro-social kind of behavior. And in fact, and, and I don't know, if, you know, if any of you else have seen some of these studies, but um, there's studies with even um, or small microorganisms kind of laying down life for a group and things like that. And you can argue that those are well, kin, those are kin relationships. Um, uh, some have suggested, well, it's it's easier to like I don't know what the equation is. It was something. It goes something like you know I would I would lay my life down for one uh, son and two. Uh, cousins and four second cousins and five. You know what I mean? That like the further you get from your own kind of uh, circle, the the less you're willing to kind of be altruistic. But friends of all, so friends of all kind of shows that uh, there there might be something towards fairness. Let's look now at pro-social behavior that might be the beginning of altruism. Look at. We also recently published an experiment. You may have heard about it on on altruism and chimpanzees. Uh, where the question is, do chimpanzees care about the welfare of somebody else? And, and for, for decades it had been assumed that only humans can do that. that. Only humans worry about the welfare of somebody else. Now we did a very a simple experiment. We do that on chimpanzees that live in Lawrenceville, in, in the field station of Yerkes, and so that, that's how they live, and we call them into a room and do experiments with them. In this case, we put two chimpanzees side by side, and one has a bucket full of tokens, and the tokens have different meanings. One kind of token feeds only the partner who chooses, the other one feeds both of them. So this, this is a study we did with Vicky Horner. And here you have the two color tokens. So they have a whole bucket full of them, uh, and they have to pick one, one of the two colors. You will see how that goes. So if this chimp makes the selfish choice, which is the red token in this case. He needs to give it to us, we pick it up, we put it on a table where there's two food rewards, but in this case only the one on the right gets food and the one on the left walks away because he, she knows already that this is not a good test for her. And then the next one is the pro-social token. So the one who makes the choices, that's the interesting part here, for the one who makes the choices, it doesn't really matter. So she gives us now a pro-social token and both chimps get fed. So the one who makes the choices always get a reward. So it doesn't matter whatsoever, and she should actually be, be choosing blindly. But what we find is that they prefer the pro-social token. So this is the 50% line, that's the random expectation. And especially if the partner draws attention to itself, 
they, they choose more. And if the partner puts pressure on them, so if the partner starts spitting water and intimidating them, then the churches go down and they actually don't want to... It's as if they're saying, if you're not behaving, I'm not going to be pro-social today. And this is what happens without a partner when there's no partner sitting there. And so we found that the chimpanzees do care about the well-being of somebody else, especially these are other members of their own group. So one of the questions that we need to start asking is like, okay, well, if, if it seems like altruism is not just a human phenomenon, then like, then and it, and it's in the natural world, and that could that mean that it's natural? So in 2010, um, a guy, E.O. Wilson, who actually kind of founded social biology, um, this kind of study of applied human or applied evolutionary theory, comes up with this idea called, and it's really controversial, by the way. Even I mean, even uh, even though he's kind of a Michael Jordan of this field, um, that. Uh, that uh, we'll call multi-level selection theory. Hold your hats, folks. It's about to get interesting with multi-level selection theory. Right? Um, uh, and it comes up with this, and it makes sense. This is the guy who kind of came up with uh, uh, applied evolutionary theory. All right. He he says this. Let x let x represent uh, bad behavior, so selfish behavior. Okay. Um, and let positives represent. Can you see that, or I can see that, or not? Represent. Uh, positive behavior, okay? Um, so there are groups of people out there. Let's just say that there, there happen to be two groups of, uh, not necessarily people, I'm sorry, just animals out there. I mean, it could, it could be people, but it also could be other animals. Um, some are selfish and some are, so how, how what do you guys think? How, how would a, a, a couple of, uh, a couple of really altruistic, uh, let's use people as examples, how could a, a couple of really altruistic people um, how would they fare in a group of people that are really selfish? They're constantly giving and they're surrounded by people that are selfish. How are they going to do? They're going to die. They're going to die quickly, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, thank you. They're going to do really bad, right? Because they're going to be like, here you go. You want my food? You want my food? And everybody's going to be like, yeah, I'll take your food, right? <laughs> how are two bad people, selfish people, I guess, I don't, I don't want to use more language than that, how are two selfish people going to fare with a whole group of people who are altruistic? Awesome. It's going to be awesome for them. Everybody's going to be like, you want some more? They're like, sure. They're going to be, you know, uh, more of the obese and, you know, assets, <laughs> and sure, right? So you would think, uh, at, at first glance, you would think, oh, well, it's better to be bad, right? They're always getting. They're always, selfish groups are always getting. But one of the questions we need to ask is, how do, do selfish people function well together with a bunch of selfish people? So like you're in a triple, okay? Uh, your two random crewmates are selfish. How does that function? Do they function well together? Not typically, right? Because they're kind of always both looking for what they want. Altruistic people kind of have the opposite. So what you have, what you have is this, is that over a period of time, this group actually starts to reduce. The major so there are always going to be altruistic people in there because they're genetically breeding as well too, right? But what you get is the majority of people um, uh, are, that are breeding actually out or get compete against worse to the people that are better. So, for instance, um, uh, this group is going to be able to build roads or civilizations or um, uh, capacity to care for all people um, or something like that. Where this group is kind of only looking for themselves. So, remember that like evolutionary, like. Uh, the way evolution works is it's about individual, it is about individual gene fitness. But individuals always live in groups. Individual, individuals always live in groups. No individual lives outside of a group, right? So when you cluster, like sometimes, sometimes this is called group selection theory. People don't like that because they're like, oh, evolution's individual. It is individual. But individuals live in groups, and the group that they live in matters. So, uh, if the group, these individuals that happen to be together actually outcompete individuals that are selfish that happen to live together. So I'm using the word happen. So not, this isn't necessary, but this, this has happened according to E.O. Wilson. And so what you get is this essentially uh, totally bad group actually goes away and gets weeded out of the gene pool. And so what you get are groups of people or animals that are largely um, largely altruistic, even though they have some capacity and abilities for selfish behavior, because these two X's aren't just intermixing with X's, they're intermixing with everybody. But you see dominant traits of altruism.
And so this is controversial. I don't think um, anybody would say that it's not within the theory of, um, of evolution. Uh, but this, is, this could explain some kind of pro-social behavior in animals. Like, like uh, they have the ability to have compassion. Um, we maybe have the ability to uh, be sacrificial or selfless because that might aid us, actually. All right, so all this to say, <coughs> I can go into more detail, but I kind of want to move on for the sake of time. We're a genetic mixed bag. We have some natural indications towards selfishness, give me what I need to survive. We also have some weirdly genetic, perhaps, or natural, maybe the, the safer word, inclinations towards altruism. You're willing to jump on a grenade. You're willing to give up food for the sake of other people, etc. All right, so that's idea one. Idea two, or B, is uh, Wesleyan holiness. So you don't, uh, you know, a lot of you are into Wesleyan holiness, but you know, I'm assuming some of you are sort of familiar with it. It means Wesleyan, Wesleyan holiness is kind of controversial. <laughs> Um, to say the least. Actually, I think it's more, way more controversial than evolutionary theory, quite honestly. <laughs> quite honestly. Um, uh, either you can be holy or you can't be holy. So it's an either or situation. It's like a pregnancy test, um, sort of, right? So this is us. <laughs> we choicely found out that the child we were, yeah, our first child we were actually trying to not have. But this is the picture that's in I get that, but we had him. <laughs> so this is our picture for that. I'm always like, smile. Like, ah. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? All right. um, so either you can be holy or you can't. You can't be like sort of pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. So I'm not trying to say that you either a person for their whole life is either holy or not holy. But either, but philosophically, either holiness is attainable or it's not attainable. It can't be sort of attainable. Does that make sense? You know, see where I'm going with that? So it's either attainable or it's not attainable. And Wesleyan uh, theology says it, in fact, is attainable. And in fact, I would argue that most, uh, all Christians uh, need to say that it is attainable, whether it's Lutherans oftentimes believe it's death itself that makes you holy. Um, Orthodox are like, oh, no, mystery. You know, they don't really know what it is. Other people like Wesleyan believe like holiness can happen in this life. Um, Catholics oftentimes believe that purgatory is the process by which you have a purge and makes you holy. So I'm not trying to say this is perfect. It's not about perfect. It's about perfect. All right. It's not about being perfect. It's about being perfect. What I mean by that is this: is that um, this doesn't mean that. Uh, first of all, I I'm not holy. Uh, I don't consider. And I'm not saying that as some sort of false humility. I'm not, and I don't <laughs> consider myself uh, holy. Uh, but I do think it is possible. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And this holiness there does not mean um, uh, perfect, like stateless. It means that you have a kind of intimate union with God. Your desires are God's desires, um, etc. All right. So if you can't be holy, then I think there's a couple questions that you just need to ask yourself before we move on. Um, then who is Jesus? Uh, you're kind of outside of orthodoxy. If you, if you believe that like, you, you can't be holy, or people aren't, won't ever get holy. Well, Jesus was kind of, we would consider Jesus to be a holy person, right? Kind of? <laughs> yeah, we would, right? <laughs> okay. um, Jesus was a person, just like you and I. Now, don't step out of orthodoxy and be like, oh, but he was like God, but with a little, you know, fairy dusting of, you know, he was like us, but with a fairy dusting of God. That's called heresy, actually. <laughs> so we can't kind of go there. He's 100% a real person. Um, this is an actual representation of what Jesus looked like at some point in his life. We don't really know which one, he had the sash, Caucasian, probably not, you know, uh, but he actually looked like this probably at one point in his life. So, a real person who we believe was holy. So, I would, if you don't believe that we can be holy, I would check the kind of orthodoxy part. If you don't believe you can be holy, then like, what do you believe about the Holy Spirit? Um, you know, your God's weak! So I found this. I thought this, you know, a la Jack Baker. Um, I thought this would be funny. It's like Jesus and the devil um, uh, arm wrestling, like they're equals. Whoa, going back and forth. Well, that's bad theology as well, <laughs> frankly, right? Um, no, if you don't believe you can, if you don't, if you don't, if you think that you're always going to have to sin, sin's inevitable. What are you going to do? Um, then I think you have really big problems theologically with like what's the point of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so what the Holy Spirit is not power. God himself can't help me out of this temptation. <coughs> That's pretty problematic. 
uh, theologically speaking. Uh, hopefully, we believe that God is a little bit more powerful than that. If one can't be holy, then Jesus' commands were just a joke. Right? Jesus is like, go and sin no more. I mean, you can't do it, but just go and sin no more. Right? <laughs> what is he? What's the point? So we do, I think, theologically have all sorts of reasons to have to believe that it's possible to live a perfect life. Um, the, uh, in, in regards to holiness, not in regards to like making a mistake or forgetting your children's names or something. <laughs> Which I'm glad you've done. Alright? Alright. If one can be holy, um, then we acknowledge the fact that we have free will. Every decision is a choice. You approach a situation, uh, should I should I eat like the fourth cheeseburger in a row right now? Uh, maybe gluttony, you shouldn't do that. You know? Three, fine. But four, I mean, that seems a little over the top, right? Should I look, uh, should I look at this guy or this girl a little bit too long? Uh, should I lie? Should I uh, steal? Should I cheat? Well, those are, I mean, we, we believe those are decisions, right? You're not forced to do that. If you're forced, I've used this example before, if I, if I get out of a bank and I put a gun to your head, and you're just like minding your own business, do 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 and I put a gun to your head and I'm like, drive! Are you responsible for being my getaway driver when I stole money from a bank? No. Culpability and free will go hand in hand. But if you're like, hey, my accomplice, and then you wait around the corner and we drive out together, then you are responsible. So if you believe, like most Christians, if there's a very few percentage of Christians that don't believe that we have free will, but if you believe that we have free will, then in fact, it's philosophically possible to string together correct choices that could lead to a holy life. I think, otherwise, I think we have a problem with our logic. All right, so how does this fit? One of the beauties, I think, of this, uh, reconciling these ideas, um, that uh, both science and this kind of theological concept of holiness, is that it helps us avoid pitfalls of dualism. We are mental, we are physical, we are spiritual, we are emotional. We are, uh, we are complex beings. Um, dualism is really bad, right? We know from, from some of you that took philosophy, um, you know that like platonic dualism is really, really bad. Why? Because it says like soul stuff good, spiritual stuff good, body stuff bad. Soul stuff good, soul stuff real. It goes to the point to say soul stuff real, body stuff bad. What does that mean about the physical resurrection of Jesus, the physical resurrection of us, the incarnation of, you know, of Christ, uh, the virgin birth? Uh, that's really bad, the new heaven, new earth, the physical earth that we're going to be on. That's really bad for our theology. So kind of avoiding those pitfalls and recognizing that we aren't just these souls, you know, like locked into this, you know, machine of a body. <laughs> Isn't it ironic when you go back and think about um, Richard Dawkins talking about us as machines and Francis Crick talking about us as kind of um, nothing but a pack of neurons? And then you hear kind of dualistic talks about like, well, we're just a soul in this like body. You know, they're actually weirdly enough saying the same thing. In fact, maybe um, maybe we should look at it that way. Maybe we should look at ourselves as mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, um, intellectual beings rather than just bifurcated like that. All right, how does it fit? Wrap it up, Hill. Here we go. All right, so how does it fit? Altruism is hardwired into our DNA. I think it is. Um, just like the bad stuff. Native Americans lack an enzyme that breaks down alcohol, um, uh, well at least, and, um, and it, one could argue, one, people, lots of people do argue that that is, they have genetic reasons uh, that are partially responsible for them, you know, for, for men, they have higher alcoholism rates than um, African descended people and Caucasian people, and uh, some argue that it's because of that lack of enzyme that, that leads them into alcoholism. Well that's bad, we say that's bad, right? Um, uh, <laughs> anger, violence, some people are more prone to violence. They're just genetically prone to anger and being frustrated. Like this horrible, wretched person here. I don't know who this is. So does that mean you're less or more culpable for your, your behavior if you're prone to those things? Well, but you're also prone to like, oh, puppies, right? You're prone to loving puppies. Why? Well, there's all sorts of biological reasons and evolutionary reasons why puppies are cute. Um, yeah, so we're a mixed bag. Um, we're also probably prone to helping our neighbor on some level. Does that take away the Holy Spirit? See, these are big problems, right? 
I obviously don't believe it does. Take, I don't believe it takes away the Holy Spirit's power in our life. I actually think that this is why John Wesley fits so well with this stuff, because I think he, he intuitively picked up on something. All right, let's look at Wesleyan holiness. Um, we're, we're good Wesleyans. I'm sure all of us in here are good Wesleyans. We believe in grace. Um, grace is not a loophole. It's, um, a, a, I think, a vehicle by which God uses to kind of help us. That word is funny around here. Oftentimes it's used a lot. Like, you know, it's like this mist floating in the air. Which is give grace. You mean be on a couple. That's what you mean, right? <laughs> no, grace uh, can be, uh, mean something different theologically. All right. Um, there's three different ways you can look at this. How does, how does uh, the biology of being a mixed bag fit with uh, an altruistic life? Am I, morally, uh, am I morally accountable for being a good person or a bad person? Should I get accolades for being a good person if I was like, that was genetically kind of forced to be a good person? Should I be held morally responsible if I was kind of just genetically a jerk or a sociopath or something like that? What do we do about that? Well, do we say that, like, okay, God's grace comes in through the Holy Spirit and it replaces our, uh, you know, now all of a sudden I'm a Native American, I, I, I have that enzyme that helps break down alcohol, or it just replaces it? Well, that's, that seems kind of illogical, illogical for a whole bunch of reasons, mostly because it picks up dualism again, at least from a theological perspective of that. Does it work in parallel? Does God kind of work alongside me to encourage my good stuff, but, you know, discourage my bad stuff? In parallel play with this kind of soul that's in there struggling back and forth with this bad body that's going, you know, that, that has been given to us by this evil evolution or something like that? Well, no, because that still has this idea, this flavor of um, uh, dualism with it. So what I want to argue is with it, and I can talk to you more about this later, but I want to get to questions, is that... Um, uh, I think there's a natural approach that we can that that God works with to help us overcome some of these constraints. So I like to use this example of a rope. Um, that you get connected with God. Let's say you know I don't know whatever your, however your faith works. Um, you get connected with God. You know whether you were baptized as a child and that's your immediate you know kind of connection with God towards this rope, or you have a conversion experience. Uh, later on in your life, but one way or another, you're a Christian, and you're connected to God, and you have this kind of rope, we'll call that, that, that grace, we'll call that rope grace, right? You're connected with God, and there are moments in your life that you pull that rope, so you keep drawing on God, right? You keep drawing on God, and you pull that rope closer and closer, and you are so close with God that you don't really need that rope to connect to you anymore. I mean, it is, but you're, 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 you're touching God. Right? And there's other parts in your life where you are so, you're about on so much rope, and you're still connected to God, but you, you know, you, you can't even see him anymore. And then maybe this is how some people walk away from the faith, I think, right? They look at this rope in their hands, they don't know what it's going to, and they're like, well, what's the point of this, right? So could it be that, that the Holy Spirit is an active agent working with our biology and our DNA to encourage us to keep drawing closer to God? I think that could be the case. And we know through virtue ethics that, like, um, if you want to get the virtues, you get it by, um, by practicing habits of virtue. It's kind of cyclical that way, right? If, uh, if you want to, uh, actually, Peter uh, Bowler talks uh, about to John Wesley, he's like, if he, you know, he struggled with his faith at one point, and he's like, if you don't have faith, preach faith until you have faith, right? I like that a lot. I think it's the same kind of way. Look, uh, if you want to get the virtues, practice the virtues, and eventually you'll have the virtues. You know, practice generosity, and eventually you'll just you'll be a generous person, virtuously. The Holy Spirit might be saying, look, you know, massaging and help these uh, working with us. Howard Snyder actually would kind of argue the same thing. God works with creation, helping us, you know, use these natural inclinations towards altruism to become a more <coughs> holy person. Why can't it be God working with rather than God always against? You could use an example of a kite, um, and this shows that, like, by the way, in Wesleyan theology, uh, our work is always a response to God's grace. I think, you know, I should say that very clearly. Our work is always a response to God's grace. So you have the Holy Spirit wooing you, and then we respond. So we have this idea called keeping in grace, that God has been working on everybody before they know him, and it woos them to God. And then, uh, eventually, you know, you actually have to show up and do something. Right? At least in Wesleyan theology, God's not just like, boom, you're saved, regardless of whether you want to or not. You're like, no, kicking and screaming. That's not how it works. Eventually, you respond out of your own action. 
We are altruistic. We are selfish. We're a genetic mixed bag. And maybe, I think, I think so, the Holy Spirit is wooing us towards holiness, which has outputs of altruistic action. I don't think altruism is equal to holiness, but I do think, like the virtues, they can kind of, they go hand in glove together. So another example that I like to, like to use is a kite. Um, you know, kite doesn't work without wind. You can have the Holy Spirit, you can have the, the altruistic kind of inclination set in place, but it does take free will and action, and maybe that represents the wind or something like that, to actually move this kite and set it sail. It's got to be both God working first and us responding at the same time. So in this way, I don't think we have to deny the fact that we are a mixed bag genetically. But I think we can say, I think it leaves room to say that God might be working through our complex, you know, human characteristics through eons of evolution to get us to a place where we can maybe be forced out to become holy. So the last kind of section of my book that I kind of talk about is what John Wesley does. He he doesn't, you know, this it would be anachronistic to say that he, he knew anything about Darwin or something like that. No, that's not how it works. But um, he intuitively picked up on what it takes to help people become holy people. He's, weirdly methodical, this is why they call the Methodist, right? Practices that made people better people. And in, I, I think that in some ways he intuitively picked up on the kind of groups and the kind of activities that actually foster this altruism within people. I mean, he helped get people out of, I mean, uh, you know, Dr. White could, I'm sure, tested this more than I could, but he got people out of um, you know, all sorts of drug or, or alcohol addiction and um, poverty issues related to kind of um, social uh, practices and you know, all sorts of terrible situations through his groups. Um, he intuitively picked up on something of the human condition um, that I think uh, was the fact that we are this genetic mixed bag. And he started help asking people to, 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 whether they know it or not, just to start working on these habits and these practices and uh, invited God in that process too. All right, uh, I'm just gonna leave this open to questions now. So I'm gonna probably stop there. Any questions or thoughts? so-called selectionist, if it moves or quacks or pukes, it's all because of selected, a selective advantage. Um, you're probably well aware of the neutral theory, Kimura's neutral theory, that not all the traits are due to selection. And Well, this is where you get mutation and replication, right? Yeah. Um, say, I was at a meeting once where someone uh, was talking about mutation and so on and so forth, and he, he said, yeah, just like what Dawkins says, and the whole room erupted in laughter. Because Dawkins' views are essentially close to 20 to 30 years out of date. Yeah, yeah I don't know if this agreed on. Selection is real, but the neutral theory is also real. There are some things that are just, you know, Stephen Jay Gould and the spandles of the cathedral and so on and so forth. They, they're historic cons contingencies. They don't really, they're invisible to selection. Sure. And they're carried along. Sure. So if we take the neutral theory and, and put that into the gearbox, shall we say, or this black box, or call it brown, whatever. <laughs> How does that then, okay, we're a mixed bag. Are we, are we mixed back solely because of natural selection? Or are we mixed back because of our history as well? Historical contingencies. And then the hand like of God has something to do in molding those contingencies. So, like in an epigenetic way? Yeah. Like, um, or not even epigenetics, just actual inheritance. <laughs> that might have been linked to something that was selected, but not. It's not really something that yeah, so, was able to see. So to right. So what Dr. Bradford is trying to say is like, well, uh, what if uh, evolution produces something that, that kind of tags along, but uh, but isn't necessarily helpful or unhelpful? Something that's neutral. So um, uh, could God select just the helpful ones or something like that? Yeah, I don't know. Sure, he can do whatever he wants. I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't know how that all works. So 
So I, what I do know is that um, I think you know scientists are asking natural questions. Theologians are asking theological questions. So um, uh, I don't think many scientists who are strictly asking natural questions would kind of get to a place where they would say God intervened in those ways. I don't see why it's a you know that would be like a um, uh, you know, a, a question even more simply, like, does God exist or does God, does God not exist? I mean, uh, I don't think that can be proven or disproven. So, I mean, to, to argue that God kind of selected certain traits of, above others could be true or could not be true. So, I, I guess I'm agnostic on that. You know, I would have no idea what God would do, you know. But, like, uh, so, and Dawkins is, I mean, he, he's an easy whipping boy. Right? I mean, so, and so, yeah, I mean, I have, like, a hundred pages dedicated to, you know, dedicated to, like, his, um, kind of reductionism, and, and people like him, so he's not alone in that, um, kind of reductionism either. Um, but, you know, his idea of selfish gene as replicator, I think that kind of base premise is, is taken seriously by most people. So he's got, he's got all sorts of weird metaphysical claims that he has. Um, all of a sudden he'll say, like, he'll say things like, um, uh, there was these uh, uh, pre-human uh, animals that were, um, uh, you know, they would go in and they would kill all the young and they would have uh, sex with all the women so they would know the children are them. But he doesn't say kill and have sex. He says murder and rape. Well, those are morally loaded things. So he's problematic on all, all sorts of places. So I think he, and then he's got the, the last chapter in Selfish Gene is about memes, which is like totally undermines this whole, so he's got all sorts of problems. But I do think his Selfish Gene idea took people to a place where uh, they said, yeah, you're right, it's not just about individual selection, it's about individual selection towards the gene. So whether that's God or not, I mean, I would, I would not know where to be. Yeah. Is it true that in evolutionary theory, that let's say 30, 40, 50 years ago, people had a problem with altruism? Because people would say, uh, well, we don't believe in, in evolution because it can't, it can't account for altruism. And that was supposed to be a big defeat. Yeah, sure. Well, then the evolutionists said, well, wait a minute. Yes, we can because yeah. ants are altruistic. Yeah, and that's um, Neil Wilson, right? Yeah, exactly. And he's just, that's his favorite thing sure. with ants. Right. Um, and so now we say, well, it's not just individuals, it's groups. But then we as Christians look at it. It's individuals and groups. I think that's important. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but no, okay. Yeah. Then we as Christians say, well, wait a minute. What a big surprise that, that when you act in a way that God tells you to, it gives you evolutionary yeah. advantage. Sure, absolutely. How, how does that surprise so, anybody? Absolutely. I couldn't have said that. Like, and this is where every, I feel like, you know, you can't look at like every new discovery because that's that's uh, you know oftentimes uh, the thing that I like about scientists is that they are always looking to be wrong. You know what I mean? I think that's a pretty cool thing. We're not we don't do that in the theology or philosophy, right? <laughs> so like they're like, hey, this is what I think, and if you can just prove that, then sweet, we're closer, a bit closer to the truth. I think that's kind of a neat concept. But and when you look kind of at a thirty thousand foot view of big discoveries that seem to hold true within science. I think it always comes back to us and be like, yeah, we were saying that all along. This is exactly what we said. Yeah, it turns out altruism is really handy, you know? Uh, that's not self-destructive. That of course, even beyond kin uh, altruism and reciprocal altruism, uh, it's just good for the group and it's good for the bigger picture. And, and that's something that I think, and I don't, you know, Wesley obviously didn't know about this stuff. He couldn't have, but I think, um, I think somehow he, intuitively picked up on certain tasks, like his small groups, and his uh, really, really um, specific uh, instructions about how to live a Christian life that fostered a certain kind of person that both virgin altruism, but on the back, or virgin holiness, but on the back of, um, you know, kind of these altruistic natural tendencies. So Robert Jastro, who is one of the main astronomers, he actually ran the uh, Mount Wilson Observatory, wrote a book in which he said that it's like the astronomers are climbing up this mountain and they get to the top and they find the theologians are there. Yeah. <laughs> and because the idea is the astronomers think now that there's a that there's a force that made the world and you know that sure. there was a beginning and so on. 
would you say that is morally the evolutionists have been climbing up the mountain, they get to the top, and they find the guys with the Bible, the, the, the theologians at the top? Um, you know, I think on some level, uh, I think, I do believe that, like, all, if, if something is absolutely true, then I think that, um, that, uh, that, that that points to Christ, because I think Christ is absolutely true. So I would actually maybe change it and say, um, could it be that scientists or something like that are coming up the back side or the front side, this side of the mountain, and um, and maybe theologians were already a little bit higher up and figuring out some of it had you know kind of some sort of well, the philosophers are the ones at the top. The philosophers are at the bottom, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like holding the phone. That's a <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know. I I, was, I I think they're just doing two different things, you know, to the same truth. And I don't know why. We, I don't think we have to be afraid of that. I don't know if one is better than the other. I think they're revealing two different um, uh, aspects. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question would be: uh, so there's that fantastic quote by Simon Veil. Uh, yeah. If I turn away from Christ, pursue truth, you won't go far before you fall into the And So uh, I guess my question would be: um, like bridging the gap between theology and uh, science, like how do you think that the church could uh, use this, kind of like I were just talking about, to say that, um, like to the science that, like, yeah, we've, we've been saying this all along, and we could be the science that you have been saying this too, because it seems that the church uh, is really afraid of stuff like this, kind of with like the, I mean, we've talked about, like, with the Ken Ham, that, like, oh, if it's not literal, and then the resurrection, like, yeah. that could be out of the bag. So, how do you think the church, uh, in 2016, or on, like, a large scale, I think you would agree that they're really afraid of stuff like this, and I could go, this is actually one of our greatest tools to, it's kind of like that quote from Augustine. Yeah, yeah. You know, yes, too. Uh, so I think, I think it is a tool, because I think um, it can be used, I think, it, I think for, so this is me talking, you know, personally, I think for evangelistic reasons, it is imperative that we let scientists be scientists. I think it, anytime uh, people that aren't qualified, and I would not, I would not, I'm not a scientist, so you know, if, you know, some, you know, y'all tell me something different, then that's fine. In, in regards to something outside of theory, um, anytime scientists say this is just the way it works, this is kind of what we studied. I, I think it's not our lay people's place to kind of challenge that and then be like, well, you got this Jesus guy, see? Because now all of a sudden we just lost, we lost any um, credibility with people because we're not willing to think. Our, ourselves or let let ourselves be challenged. So I do think it's imperative that we um, kind of let scientists be scientists and let uh, theologians be theologians um, and let philosophers, you know, wait the car. <laughs> uh, so I think that's the first thing. I think it's imperative not just for like um, getting closer to the truth, but I think it's imperative for not muddying the truth. And I don't think we need to be afraid of this. I don't think we need to be afraid of this. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the things I love about the Free Methodist Church is that it does not take a position on origins, and it does not take a position on end times. You know what it says about end times? I don't know, I guess God's going to win. I mean, it says a little more articulate than that, but it's like, I don't, we don't really know how, but it's, that's how it works. You know what it says about origins? God created. Just know that God created. That's, a, that's great, because why do we need to know anything more than that? Of these, of, you know... So I think that gives us the freedom to say, well, scientists are telling us this is how we're, the way things work. Well, okay, so what is our response to that? Why, how might God have been using that? How might God have been speaking with this group of people, <coughs> people 70,000 years ago? I think that gives us a lot of freedom to, and hope. I think it actually can be pretty hopeful. I don't think it has to kind of destroy our faith. <coughs> yeah? I was curious about your counsel of fairness and moral culpability. Does that actually apply to sin, do you think? Like, does someone be, like, make more of what they have? Yeah, so, so you're, and that's great. So you're asking really a question about what about sin and selfishness? And let's, like, let's kind of throw it in the positive. What about altruism and holiness? Because they are different, right? We would say that, like, um, one uh, could be selfish uh, in particular instances that maybe could result in a holy act. And vice versa. So I, I think it's important to separate those and not get those confused. Um, 
Uh, I just think that there are more connections than uh, separations with that. So I, I don't ever to me that altruism and holiness are equal or the same thing, or that sin and selfishness are the same thing. I do think we have to give logical categories for such. You know, sin, uh, Wesley calls sin direct violations of known laws of God. So that's, you know, are you sinning if you, if you didn't know? Shoot, I didn't know that that was a problem or something like that. Then, you know, Wesley would say, well, that's not good. And you might need to kind of refine yourself, become holy, even have, you know, penance in some way. But you're not sinning in the same kind of way that if you kind of knew, yeah, you've been there. You guys have been there. Sure, certainly not today. But I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's kind of what Wesley thinks. Any last thoughts? Questions? Where'd you get the monkey video? Oh, I just keep saying, I don't know. I should show that to my kid. Yeah, yeah I should. Um, I tell you, friend, you know, uh, friends of all, he's not, it's not sort of not a Christian, uh, he believes in God or anything like that. Um, but he does, he makes this interesting claim that he, he says, um, uh, he's like, he, and, this is not me speaking, so this is him, just to, you know, for video's sake. You know. uh, that like, oh, well, morality can come about, he thinks, without the help of religion. But religion really helps people be more. It's interesting. And he yeah, raises a few eyebrows in, um, uh, in kind of the atheist circle. So. Yeah? Is the controversy that Yeah, the con she, she asked about the controversy surrounding why why is Wesleyan holiness so controversial? It's controversial because it's really close to this heresy called Pelagianism, um, which is kind of like you don't need God necessarily to. I mean, yeah, tell me if I'm you know wrong, but you don't need God necessarily to be um, to be perfect, and you can be perfect kind of on your own. And that and then people kind of confuse being perfect with mistakelessness. Uh, like, you never make a mistake, you know, well, Dad, you're going 36 and 35, sooner, you know, something like that. <laughs> no, like, mistakes are different than sin. So Wesley, Wesley actually took pains, he took, like, half of his ministry to kind of show that he wasn't a religion. Um, I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit, but he, he was really worried about that. Um, because he wanted to always show that God works first, and we respond. And I think, I really do think, I do, I genuinely think, I, the idea of holiness is more controversial in an ironic way than evolution is. And I think that it is unbelievably philosophically sound. That it makes sense that, that, that you can do that in this life, that one can do that in this life. Um, you know, I don't really know how to, but you know, that's where we look, uh, that's where we look to people that are, you know, better done that, you know, to be able to get a sense of how to do that. All right, thanks. Thanks for coming.